Hello friends, welcome back to part four of the project interview questions and answers. Let us begin with the lecture. So next question would be, what could be the potential causes of server hang? So this is a very vast question, okay? The server can be hanged with the multiple reasons. There is, should not be a single reason or single cause for the hang of a server, okay? So let me list out or figure out for you the most important causes that can cause your server to be hanged. The one is, the first one is the heap memory issue. Your, if your heap memory is not sufficient, okay, then your server will get hanged because your uh, JVM will not get the uh, space to create the object or to assign the threads for the request, okay? So if your heap memory is short, then again, you will feel a problem of hang, okay? This is the first cause. Second is garbage collection taking much time, okay? So, and uh, for this heap and garbage collection, I would recommend to go through my another video, which I have posted as a G JVM or Java heap performance tuning, okay? There you will get a complete understanding of Java heap and garbage collections, okay? So now when we talk about the garbage collection taking much time, that means whenever we, this garbage collection executed inside the JVM heap, okay? It pause your applications when it, when it look up for the, uh, the dead objects inside your heap memory and the object that is not in use and need to be clean, so that time your application get paused and which can impact the performance of your application okay so if your heap size is even very big okay which is even not as consumed by your application and if you are defining a heap uh, by thinking that by giving a big high, bigger size of heap size your application performance would decrease that is not true okay because if your heap size is very high okay in that case your garbage collection would get, take a long time okay so that can be also degrade your performance as well second is the capacity issue okay so maybe uh, you are all the parameters are good, but but the capacity is not sufficient. That means overall capacity in the sense is the number of servers that you have in a cluster, the number of uh, cores or CPUs that you have, the number of your the kind of a heap memory that you have assigned to to your physical machines or okay or to your managed servers or admin servers. Okay, so that means there would be capacity issue that the request that you are expecting on your system is about uh, you are expecting the load could be around two thousand. Okay, maybe the, the hitting the request the request that is coming to your server could be three thousand four thousand. Okay, so you would be running out of the capacity. Okay, so you have to look for that uh, from that side as well. And there could be network issues, okay? And network issues could be from any end, okay? That because the request flow is that your request come from load balancer to your web server, from web server to your application server, and from web application server to backend admin server, or backend database server, okay? So there could be a glitch in your uh, application server to your database network. There could be a glitch between your web server to your application server network. There could be a glitch from the load balancer side, or there could be a glitch between the load balancer and your web server as well. So there could be a network issue as well, which can, cause the hang of your applications and your server as well, okay? There could be database issues, okay? There are a lot of requests that go into a database and it is not able to cater the complete request or requirement that is coming from the application server due, due to the bad performance of your database, the queries there are uh, procedures or triggers that are, that are getting executed at the database side from the application, okay? It is taking long time, which may also cause the server hang. Integrated application issues. So if you have an enterprise world, if you have a different type of integrations where you have a lot of source systems, a lot of destination systems for home where your logic applications are receiving the data and then it is sending to a lot of destinations. Okay, that means it is it is receiving from somewhere, it is sending to somewhere. But if you are, uh, for example, if your uh, system which is accepting accepting the data from your logic application server is not able to capable to sub, to cater the uh, request that is coming from the logic server. In that case, your WebLogic performance may get degraded because it is expecting that this kind of a load to be accepted by the destinations, but they are not capable. So in that case as well, your server will hang. And there could be a possible with the bad code, okay? That means the, develop, the, the, the code that you have deployed in your applica application server, bar, EAR, jar, or whatever. So there could be a problem from the uh, code side as well. So next could be, uh, what are the supported installation modes available for WebLogic? So what are the different modes? How we can install the WebLogic? Okay, so it again depends on the different kind of a requirement, what kind of a system you have, what kind of a privilege you have. Okay, based on that, you can do a different kind of installation. So first one is the console mode, which is a text mode. That means you will start the installer and then you will get the different prompt and then you will start giving the input to the prompt and then you will install your WebLogic. And second is the graphical mode where you have a, uh, just like Windows machine, you have a graphical uh, interface, uh, access then you can directly initiate the installer and then by clicking just entering the value and click next 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 you can do the installation third is a silent mode in silent mode you can create a silent xml file okay where you can provide the parameter that is required for the installation and then you can initiate the 
installer with the help of silent script and it will install it automatically so you don't need to provide any kind of input because that you have given in the input xml file so for that i have posted another uh, video on my channel okay you can go through that one the, for the installation uh, mode of your vision middleware technologies in silent mode okay and what is the difference between horizontal and vertical clustering so what clustering we know that we it is a solution for the high availability one and the load balancing right where you have a multiple managed servers those handle the request from the client okay and horizontal clustering involves running multiple java application servers that are run on two or more separate physical machines in that case we have a cluster and we are our cluster is spans across multiple physical machines so there could be n number of physical machines let us suppose that we have a two physical machine okay and we have a cluster of two managed server ms1 ms1 so it is same name because it is running on two different servers okay so because now it is a two different servers so i could have a same name for your managed servers or this could be a different as well okay so but but thing is that in horizontal clustering we have a cluster which is spanned across multiple servers okay so in the picture you can see that i have two machines two servers and then i have a cluster of two managed servers one managed server is on machine one and second managed server is on machine two so this is called a horizontal clustering and when we talk about a vertical clustering that means everything on a single machine single server okay so here i have a single machine or server single server and there would be a cluster there would be a two managed servers okay so why we are using a single vertical cluster and why we are using a horizontal cluster for that completely depend on the organization requirement but as a standard practice single vertical clustering we can use for our testing development environments okay and then when we go for the production or a pre production which is a copy of your production right uh, for for pre testing of your application which is go you are going to deploy in your production for that we use a horizontal clustering so that we can get the high availability right because if your much suppose we have a we have a vertical clustering and your machine get crashed then everything is down but when we have two machines are running and your machine one is get crashed at least you have a second machine is available in the cluster or maybe more than that one for for catering the client requirement okay and when when we say what are the benefits of horizontal clustering okay or what is that benefit of only clustering okay then it is a scalability and high availability scalability in the sense to, to, today we have a two uh, managed servers in the cluster okay and tomorrow if you, if, if you if the load in your load of your application is getting increased right earlier you were getting 100 number of requests and today now you are getting a 120 150 or 200 of requests right so you have to scale your system so in that case in case you can easily create one two or three or as many as many servers many servers you required and then you can assign to your cluster so that means you can scale your uh, system production system at any time with the n number of managed servers okay and high availability in the sense that you have a load balancing and failover so you have a multiple managed server is one is one is get crashed and others are available to to cater the requirement right to process the request and load balancing is you have multiple managed servers so requests are diverting to each and every managed servers equally so one will not get overloaded failover in the sense if you have a session which is connected to managed server one and your client is doing something and it has some session data of your client if your server one get crash in between when your client is doing something and his session is his or her session is connected to managed server one then if that time your managed server one get crash then the request will fail over to managed server two and all the session data which was there in the managed server one when he was connected or she was connected it will be fail over to your managed server Two. That means the session will be failover to a different managed server along with the session data. So this is the capability of failover, and this is the capability of your clustering. And you can say this is the benefit of your clustering. And what type of objects can be clustered? Okay, so there are different kind of a objects are there. Okay, and again, what I would recommend to go back to my channel, and then I have posted a video on performance tuning, load balancing in WebLogic Server. There I have explained about the, all different kind of objects. Okay, servlets, JSP, EJBs, RMI calls, JMS, and all these things I have explained in very detail. Okay, now when we talk about from an inter interview point of uh, view, okay, so you can say that we can uh, uh, we can cluster the servlets, JSP, EJBs, RMI objects, JMS. database jdbc data source connections whatever the configurations we do in web logic that we can cluster all together okay so for servlets and jsp we need a web server so for that our web application server web logic is there because it has a capability of web server as well as application server and servlets and jsp is need a servlet container which is a part of your web server and when we talk about the jms jdbc or ejbs then you need a application server because for that you need a servlet you need a ejb container okay and some enhanced uh, functionalities which is which is possible only in the application server like web logic server okay 
and how do stubs work in weblogic server so this is the topic that most of the time i saw that a lot of engineers are very confused on what is their exactly stub okay but very simple so clients that connect to a weblogic server cluster and look up a clustered object contain a replica of a stub for the object that means when we know that we have a cluster where we have a multiple managed servers are running for high availability right and whenever any client connect to a cluster okay then whenever a client is connecting to your weblogic server cluster then it get a stub of for the object Okay, that means it get a replica aware stub. So replica aware, why we are saying that it, in that stub you will have a complete information of all of the various servers those are running in the cluster and their state. If I have a four various servers, then when a client is connect to the server, a cluster a application which is deployed on the cluster, that that client application session will get a replica aware stub. Which will contain the complete information of the cluster. That means the number of managed servers, the state of managed servers running that. Time. So this is sub contain the list of available server instances that host implementation of the object. So when I am saying that a client is connecting to your application, that means it is connecting to sub Java based applications, right? Uh, which create the objects for the execution in the JVM heap, right? So whenever the client is connecting to your uh, cluster, okay, then this he will that that client application session will get a replica where stub which will contain the complete information of our their running instances. Okay, and the stub also contains the load balancing logic for distributing the load among its host servers. And when we are saying that the requests are coming to your cluster, and then from cluster we have a load balancing algorithms where the requests are getting a load balance between different managed servers. Okay, so this is with the help of can say the stub is working in that one. Okay, so whenever a request is come, then the your stub helping all the information of your clusters and their running man, running managed servers. Those are running currently there in the backend. Okay, so this load balancing. Uh, is happened with the help of stubs. Okay, so clustering cluster has a benefit of load balancing where we define the round robing and then weight base and then random as well. But actually, it is done by the stub. So if any time if you have four managed servers, one got down and only three is running, then this stub get updated with the current number of running servers. So you should not look for the server which is not running at that time. So whenever the failure occurs, the stub remove the failed server instances from its list. The stub periodically refreshes its list of available server instances in the cluster. So if any server got failed any time from the cluster, then it will be removed from the stub. So that stub should not waste the time to assign it to the server which is not running. And this list of running servers in a stub is refreshed automatically in few seconds or few, uh, in few milliseconds. And what is the difference between T3 and HTTP? What is T3 web logic? Okay, so we all know about the basic of HTTP protocols. For again, I would recommend to go to your uh, my channel and then look for the service performance tuning, load balancing and HTTP RMI part five. Okay, for detailed explanation. So HTTP, we all know it is a request that we hit from the web server. So that means all the requests that is coming from the web browser to your web server okay this is a http request okay the, or you can say it is a http communication now but what is t3 okay so apart from that what we have learned about is that there are two way of connecting your application to web logic one is the http protocol that means the client are accessing the application from the browser that means it is a web application because they are going to connect from the web browser so my web application is deployed on web logic and client is using the browser with the help of http protocol it is accessing my application now another way is that there could be application to application communication. That would be a communication between different JVMs. For example, I have some applications deployed on my WebLogic server. There's a client application which need to communicate, talk to my uh, Java objects directly, okay, which would not be a HTTP call. Okay, in that case, it would be RMI call, which is called a remote method invocation. In that case, when one JVM is talked to another JVM, okay, with the help of a protocol, and that protocol is called T3. Okay, for example, if my my, my application uh, is uh, need to contact uh, with the database and it need a JDBC connection, so application will connect with the data uh, with with the web logic with the help of JNDI, right? As I said in the some previous slides, when application need a connection from the database, it will look for the JNDI name and then from JNDI with the help of JNDI object, it will go back to the backend resources which is data source and then it will take the connection from the database. So my application which is developed in the Java. It is contacting the application server for JNDI name. Okay, that means it is an application to application communication. There is no uh, end users are involved here, right? So such kind of a communication where one application is contacting to different application with the help of uh, uh, RMI object, and then it is called uh, T3 protocol. So the call would be RMI. Okay, the invocation of that uh, call would be through RMI, remote method invocation. But the protocol that would be used for this RMI call, 
is the T3 protocol. So you can say T3 protocol is a communication protocol, okay, which would be used for the application to application uh, communication or from from uh, JVM to JVM kind of a communications. T3 protocol is used, but that call is called a remote method invocation call. Thanks for watching this video and stay tuned for next video.